Okay, we're starting the class now. So I'm, we're recording this for, I don't know why, but we are. Yeah, that's the word. Okay, so today I want to talk about Solomon. Is everyone excited about that? Yeah. Okay. Um, today is also All Saints Day. So uh, happy All Saints Day, everybody. All Saints Day is this uh, traditional, that's where we get Hallow Halloween from. Uh, it's uh, All Hallows Eve, All Saints Eve. Um, and uh, so this is kind of a tradition in the church to think about um, the saints that surround us. Um, kind of, and, and a traditional passage that has been read on All Saints Day is Hebrews 11, where it talks about the heroes of faith, right? By faith... Um, now faith being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see for this is what the ancients were commended for by faith we understand that the universe was formed by God's command by faith Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain by faith Enoch was taken from his life by faith Noah when warned about things to be seen built an ark by faith Abraham was called to go to another place by faith Abraham did more things, and Sarah also, um, lots of stuff on Abraham. By faith, Isaac and received the blessing. Um, by faith, Jacob. By faith, Joseph. By faith, Moses. Um, by faith, Rahab. By faith, um, and what more shall I say? I have not had time to tell about Gideon and Barak and Solomon or Samson and Jephthah, David, Samuel, or the other prophets. And then, um, the writer concludes with this. Therefore, since we ha are surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and run and, and sin which so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race cut, marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. So this idea of, of this cloud of heroes of the Bible, uh, we can probably extend it to heroes of church history, um, that surround us, that encourage us on um, as models, sometimes as, uh, everybody is a model, whether it's a good model or a or poor model, right? So um, today we wanna to talk about Solomon. All right, so let's, uh, let's start with prayer. Thank you God for this time that we can come together and study your word. Um, thank you so much for all the great heroes of Bible, um, for the role models they are, for the examples they are, um, for the bad examples that we can learn from as well. Um, today, as we look at Solomon and the really complicated aspects of Solomon, I pray that you give us insight and um, help us to fall in love with this book more and more. Amen. Okay. So, um, I made a slip when I was reading here. Um, Solomon isn't actually in Hebrews. It says uh, Samson's included. Um, and if, you're, if you know Samson's life, that's, uh, he's a little questionable, right? But David's included, Samuel's included, but, and the prophets are included, but Solomon isn't here. Um, so my title for this little talk is uh, Solomon, Hero of Ireland. Is that, is that a, what do you think of that title? Is that provocative? Is that did that make you, well, obviously it didn't attract a lot of people, but <laughs> what, uh, what do you think of that title? You started out as a hero. You started out as a hero. Okay. Any other thoughts? What, have you thought about this? Is, is hero, is it? Yeah. Hmm? Yeah, yeah. What do you think of Solomon? Is, is, is he, when you think of Solomon, do you think, think of him as a, a role model? The wisest man. Wisest man, okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Remember, all the Bible stories about him are good. Where he's, you know, the, the story of let's cut the baby in half. Yeah. And God gave him wisdom. Queen of Sheba came to see how beautiful everything was. But when I was a kid, you don't hear Bible stories about a thousand wives and how yeah, yeah. combined. Yeah. For some reason, that wasn't in my children. Yeah, and a couple of years ago, I wrote a paper on Solomon, and uh, I was surprised when I started looking at the stories of Solomon, because there's, there's two stories of Solomon. Solomon's story is recorded in, in Samuel Kings, 
and is recorded again in Chronicles. And if you read those two accounts of Solomon, they are very different. Um, the chronicler is very positive about Solomon, lots of really positive stuff. And the, the kings is, is fairly negative about Solomon. Um, so we have these kind of two portraits of Solomon. And so today, my plan is, what is my plan? My plan is uh, to kind of look at scripture, or we're going to look at scripture, and I want us to just become more and more aware of the beauty um, and the rich complexity of this Bible, biblical narrative. Um, I, the, this section, the, the section we're reading through right now in church, the song, Samuel, Kings, this is like the best part of the Bible for me. I really love this part. It's like, it's, a, it's really complicated, complicated, complex. I'm, I'm not using complex in like, complex can be used as a negative thing. I'm, I'm thinking about complex in like, it's like all this really depth, interesting stuff going on there. And sometimes when we read these books, we have these stories that we tell children and we don't really study the, the really interesting character stuff that's going on in these stories. So my goal in this, in these, this is just, I'm doing today and the next week, my goal here is just for us to help us to see a little bit of the beautiful, rich, complex, biblical narrative in the Bible. So think about that. Uh, another thing I want to do is I want to explore a book that is often ignored, um, and that is the book of Chronicles. Chronicles, it repeats lots of stuff that's in Samuel Kings. Um, a lot of times it's word for word, and so often we just skip it. Um, I know that even in our, even in our um, lectionary for this church, we have kind of the readings for the, and we have like Chronicles, but it's bracketed there. You can read it if you want to, but it's not really necessary. So Chronicles is kind of this neglected book. So I want to kind of look into Chronicles a little bit to kind of understand it. Um, another thing I want to do is I want to compare the stories in Samuel Kings with Chronicles. And that's what I'm doing with Solomon. I'm, I'm really kind of focusing on, we, we could do the uh, entire study of everything that's going on in Samuel Kings versus Chronicles, but I really want to focus down on how Solomon is portrayed in these two different stories, um, in Chronicles versus Kings. So that is my plan. Does that sound good? Everyone excited about this? Okay. All right. And I should say that there's some things that I'm going to say today that might be upsetting because because a lot of people haven't read Chronicles, and there's some contradictions in Chronicles and King Solomon that is it's that are quite uh, difficult to deal with. So bear with me. Okay? Sound good? Everyone excited? Yeah. Okay. All right. So let me start by, by talking about telling good stories, the task of a historian or the task of a storyteller. So what happens uh, when someone tells a story, like these stories of the Bible, you have these kind of past events, and a storyteller, no matter what kind of storyteller you are, what you have to do is you have to select and arrange and interpret this material. You, 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 can't, you can't give everything, um, so you select pieces of the story, you arrange it, you interpret it in certain ways, and you tell a story, okay? That's all kinds of storytelling is, is like that. You, you have to, you have the events, and then you tell a story about those events. And those stories can be better or worse, right? We've all heard a poorly told story. We've all heard good stories, right? And really what makes a story good, what makes a story coherent and engaging, when it's a coherent, engaging narrative, it has some kind of focus to it. It has some kind of thematic focus. And in the Bible, there's some kind of theological focus of why the story is being told. So, for example, there's all these kind of biographies that you can, these movie biogra bi biographies on TV, right, that you see, that some of us have seen. Have anyone seen those? those? And so, some of you? Life stories of people on, on movies. And no one's seen these. Someone's seen them. Okay. So I am sure some of you have seen these. And I'm sure some of you have seen some that are really, really bad. They just kind of chronicle, they'll can, kind of just random events. There's no kind of coherent theme going on there. And some stories are really engaging and gripping, but they leave off certain things. They 
focus on certain things, they emphasize certain things, and they just really focus on a certain theme, right? Um, do, does that make sense? Even when I'm telling my own story to people, if, if someone asks me about my life, I can tell my story in different ways, right? I can include certain events, exclude certain events, I can arrange things, I, they're all true, but I can arrange the stories differently depending on my audience and what I'm trying to get across, right? So, so if I'm at a church and I have to give my testimony, my story will include certain things. Um, if I'm talking to a, a friend uh, about um, why I love my wife, then I will tell that story a little differently. Some, some parts of the story will overlap, but there'll be different parts of that story I'll select, right? Depends on my focus of the story. Does that make any sense? Are you, are you with me? Okay. So this happens in the Bible as well. There's these past events that the, the narrator, um, the inspired narrator wants to tell, and they select, arrange, interpret those events, and they focus those events through a theological grid. And that's how they tell the story. Now we have these two storytellers um, that we're talking about today. Um, one is, uh, uh, I'll get into this, sometimes called the Deuteronomist, or sometimes called the chronistic, the chronistic history and the Deuteronomistic history. Sometimes it's called that. I'll, I'll explain what that means. These two different ways of telling a story. These, 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 this, they tell a story of Solomon from a, a certain perspective. So the first one is sometimes or very often called the Deuteronomistic, Deuteronomistic history. So, um, so this is a uh, Kings and Samuel falls into this. So these books are in the in the Hebrew Bible. These books fall in the section of the Bible called the prophets, and these are the former prophets, right? So in the Hebrew Bible, the division is you have the Torah the prophets and the writings. Th these books fall in the section of the, Torah, uh, section of the Hebrew Bible called the prophets. And Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Kings are, are known as the former prophets, and then we have the minor prophets, and uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, all those guys, okay? Um, this, this section, these four books, because Samuel, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings were originally one book. They just divide the scroll because the scrolls would get too big. It's sometimes called the Deuteronomistic history, and that's kind of a 20th century term in, in biblical scholarship. And it comes from this guy, um, this German uh, biblical scholar named Martin Note. And he, he proposed this idea that Deuteronomy Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings were all written by a single author during the exile. Okay, and he called that the Deuter Deuteronomist. Deuteronomist. That's so hard to say. Deuteronomist, okay? Um, so that was his theory. And, and the reason he, he said that is because a lot of these books, Deuteronomy and these four books in the, in the, these four former prophets shared lots of kind of theological concerns a lot of the style, a lot of the language, a lot of the content was very, very similar, right? Um, there's lots of problems with Martin, uh, with Notes', notes uh, history. Some, like conservative Christians didn't like the dating of, of the things to, to put Deuteronomy way later. That was problematic for a lot of people. Um, and that there, there is uniqueness in these books, even though there's a lot of similarity in these books. There's There's definitely uniqueness in these books, that they're not, so, so more argument later on by biblical scholars was, no, it's probably not one author. It's probably multiple authors for sure. Um, but his main point that I think is legitimate is to say that Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Kings are highly indebted to Deuteronomy. The themes in Deuteronomy just come out again and again in those books, okay? So even though I'm not really comfortable with everything that Nolte said, this his idea that these books should be read as kind of building on Deuteronomy, I think is an important idea. Okay, are you still with me? Still makes sense? Okay. So Deuteronomy provides a theological foundation for Joshua Kings. 
Okay? And so Deuteronomy, here, here's a little, little excerpt from the Bible Project, a little cutoff. So in Deuteronomy, if we recall Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy is about a call to covenant faithfulness. This is like Moses' sermon at the end of his life, and he calls people to this covenant. And he says, there's a warning and an ultimatum. There's the, uh, if you listen and obey, if you follow the covenant, there will be blessing. If, you, if there's rebellion, there'll be devastation and exile, right? So today I set before you life or death, blessing or cursing, goodness or evil. So choose life by loving the Lord your God and listening to him, okay? And then he, later on Moses says, I know you're going to rebel and go into exile, but one day God will circumcise your hearts and you can love God, so you can love God and live, okay? So this, this, this is kind of a big theme of Deuteronomy, this blessing, cursing, if you obey, you'll be blessed. If you disobey, you'll be cursed. And this idea that God's covenant is there. Okay, that, that's the big, big picture of, of Deuteronomy. So Samuel and Kings were written during the exile, right? So, so uh, Israel was taken to captivity by Babylon, and the writers, the people are in Babylon. And Samuel and Kings are addressing this crisis of faith among the exiled Judeans living in Babylon. Like, what happened to us? Why, why, did, why did God let us be taken into exile? And the, question, the answer to that question, or the question is, why has God done such a thing to, to this land and to this temple? Right? And the answer, God did not fail, Israel failed, nevertheless, God's promises are everlasting. That's kind of the answer that comes through. That when you read Samuel and Kings, people disobey, um, there's, there's curses, so people turn back to God. There's this kind of cycle that happens over and over, return back again. And so there's always the idea of remember Deuteronomy. Remember what Moses said in Deuteronomy, that this will happen. Moses predicted this will happen if we, if we turn away. So it's always pointing back to Deuteronomy. Okay, so always remembering Deuteronomy. So we have this in, in Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Kings, we have this recurring pattern of prosperity. People are doing well, and then there's, then there's apostasy, rebellion, and eventually exile. And that's, those stories or those events are told in a way that always points backwards to Deuteronomy's call for blessings and cursings. Whenever that happens, it's always this Think back on Deuteronomy. God said, you will be blessed, you will be cursed. You have to go back to the covenant. Okay. So when you're reading Samuel and Kings, and you're reading what's happening there, there's always this pattern of things are going okay, things are going bad, and it's always kind of returning to this call to choose life. And that even happens in individuals' lives. Like in David, you see that in David. David is going, things are going well, and then things go bad, and David repents, and things go good, and then David does something bad, and then he repents. So this kind of thing happens over and over throughout the stories of Samuel and Kings. Does that make sense? Did I say anything that uh, was unclear or highly controversial? Yeah, right. So the, the southern king was living in Babylon. The northern king was wiped out by Assyria a long time ago, or a couple of hundred years before this. Okay. I think, I think the people come in the Bible, the assumption is those books of Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles are just history. Yeah. They're just, they're just telling the story. And what you're saying is it's, it's people looking back at their history give meaning to their presence. That's right. It's not, just it's not just recording events that are random, that are not connected with each other. These books are so beautiful because there is a storyteller that's telling this unified, integrated story that makes sense. It's not just random events. When you read these books, it's not just story after story, unrelated. There's a big picture going on here that we need to grab onto. Okay. All right. Are you ready to move on to Chronicles? Uh, yeah. Oh, Go ahead. So many, many years that this individual was writing away. Right? You said they were written by 
person. That's one theory. That was that was Nolt's theory. It, that that theory has been kind of debunk. Well, or or they, they there's there's different interpretations. It's, it's more like a school or or a. a, a uh, or a group, or a kind of a, a thematic thing. So it's it's not it. That was a pro one of the problems with this theory. By, by certain people had is that it was that idea of the individual and, and putting Deuteronomy later rather than Moses. So, but 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 his concept, I think, is legitimate. That Deuteronomy is really highly influential in in understanding these other books. Okay. All right. So the chronistic history, these books, the so chronicles, so remember King uh, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings are all in the prophets section of the, of the Hebrew Bible. Chronicles is in the part of the Bible that's called the writings, okay? And chronicles um, is connected with Ezra and Nehemiah. So first and second chronicles, originally one book, so it's Chronicles, Ezra, and Nehemiah, and Ezra and Nehemiah was originally one book. It's, the scroll was split as well. And um, Chronicles and Ezra and Nehemiah are also linked. So the, the last verses of Chronicles, the last, uh, oh, it says like three verses of Chronicles are the starting verses of Ezra. So there's a linkage there. Okay, they're not, they're, they're, they're probably not a continuous book, but they're, really closely related. So these, this is called the chronistic history. And these three books or two books share many of the same religious interests and ideology, okay? So I'm gonna show you, oh, if this worked, I would show you something. Hang on. I'm gonna show you a video by the Bible Project that talks about the structure and the purpose of Chronicles. I think this summarizes it really well. So here we go. Hopefully this will. The books of First and Second Chronicles. While they're two separate books in our Bibles, that division is not original. Due to scroll length, the book was divided in two, but it was written as one book with one coherent storyline. Now, in our English Bibles, Chronicles comes after the books of Samuel and Kings, and most of Chronicles is actually repeat content from those books. And so most modern readers, when they come to Chronicles, they think, wait a minute, I just read all of this, and so they skip it. And that's a shame, because this book is really unique and important in the Bible. In the traditional Jewish ordering of the Bible, Chronicles is actually the last book because it summarizes all of the Jewish scriptures. The first word in the book is Adam, the first character at the beginning of the story, and then the last paragraph announces the return of Israel from exile. Now, we don't know who wrote this book, but we can tell from details within it, it was produced by somebody who lived a couple hundred years after the Israelites returned from the Babylonian exile. Now, for this author, Jerusalem and the temple were rebuilt some time ago, and as we learned from Ezra and Nehemiah, things were not going well. The great prophetic hope was that the city and the temple would be rebuilt, that God would come to live among his people, the messianic king would come, and all the nations would come live under his peaceful rule, and none of that has happened. And so the author of Chronicles has reshaped these stories of David and Solomon and the kings of the past in order to provide a message of hope for the future. And we'll see that he's designed this book to emphasize two clear themes. First, the hope of the coming messianic king, and second, the hope for a new temple. Let's just dive in and you'll see these themes all over the book. First Chronicles begins with nine chapters of genealogies, long lists of names. And you'll read these and think that this is kind of boring, and that may be true for you, but actually they're very, very important. The author is summarizing here the whole storyline of the Old Testament by naming all of the key characters in the stories. And as he does so, he shapes the genealogies to emphasize two key lineages. First is the line of the promised messianic king. So lots of space is dedicated to tracing the line of Judah that led all the way to King David, to whom the messianic promise was given. And then from David, the author traces that line up into his own day. The other family line that receives lots of attention here is that of the priesthood, the descendants of Aaron, who of course served in the temple. And so right from the start, you can see the two main themes, the author's hope of the Messiah coming to build a new temple, and it's rooted in these ancient genealogies. 
Now, after that, the author moves into the stories about David, and most of these are going to be familiar to you from the book of Samuel, but again, there's some really important differences. So first of all, the author leaves out all of the negative stories about David where he's portrayed as weak or immoral. So Saul chasing David around the desert and persecuting him, the story of David's adultery with Bathsheba and then murdering her husband, all of that is gone. And what's left are the stories that portray David as a good guy. And not only that, there's also new additional material that you won't find in the book of Samuel that shows David in a very positive light. So there's a large block of chapters where David makes preparations for the temple. He arranges resources and builders and Levites and choirs. And not only that, the author also portrays David as a Moses-like figure. God gives David plans for building the temple just as he gave plans to Moses for building the tabernacle. So why all this new material about David? The author's not trying to hide David's flaws. He knows that anybody can go read about them in the book of Samuel. Rather, he's trying to portray David as the ideal king in order to make him an image or a type of the future Messiah from the line of David. It's very similar to how Jeremiah or Ezekiel spoke of the coming Messiah as a new David. This is most clear in how the author retells the story of God's covenant promise to David in 1 Chronicles 17. When you compare this story with its parallel in 2 Samuel 7, you'll see that the author of Chronicles is highlighting that neither David nor Solomon nor any of the kings from his line were the messianic king, and that when the Messiah does come, he will be a king like David. And so for this author, these stories about David from the past are what sustain his hope for the future. After David dies, we move into 2 Chronicles, which focuses on the kings that lived in Jerusalem. And again, there's lots of overlap with 1 and 2 Kings, but there are many key differences. So the author has left out all of the stories about the kings of northern Israel so he can just focus on the line of David. And there's lots of new material about these kings from David's line. He highlights the kings that were obedient to God, and he adds new stories about how their obedience led to success and God's blessing. But he also adds new stories about kings who were unfaithful to God. They didn't follow the Torah. They led Israel to worship idols. And these kings face horrible consequences all leading up to Israel's exile, a mess of their own making. And so this whole section becomes a series of character studies where the author wants later generations of Israelites to learn from their family history and so become faithful to their God and the Torah. Now the book's conclusion is really unique too. At the very end of the book, the king of the Persians is named Cyrus, and he tells the Israelites that they can go back home, return from exile, rebuild the city and the temple. And he says, last line of the book, whoever there is among you of all his people, may the Lord his God be with him and let him go up. And that's how the book ends, with an incomplete sentence. Now, of course, the author knows about the first return from exile and the stories of Ezra and Nehemiah, but clearly in his view, the prophetic hopes of Israel were not fulfilled in those events. And so this incomplete ending shows that the author's hope is set on yet another return from exile, when the Messiah will finally come to rebuild the temple and restore God's people. And so the book of Chronicles, it's the final book of the Jewish scriptures, it ends by pointing forward. It calls God's people to look back in order to look ahead, because the past has become the source of hope for the future. So Chronicles concludes the Old Testament as a story in search of an ending, and that's what this book okay. is all about. I thought that was a good summary of things. Any, uh, does that make sense? So Chronicles is taking the material from Samuel and Kings and shaping it for the purposes of the Chronicler, which is to present an ideal version of David and focus on the temple. So temple and David, really important for Chronicles, right? So it's post-exilic, it's after the people have, have returned from exile from Babylon, they're back in Israel. It's written to encourage the dispirited Judeans after return from exile. And the stories of the past provide hope for the future, okay? So here in this story, you have this idealized king and temple. So you're taking these stories, you're idealizing them, and you're pointing forward to a messianic king and a new temple. Okay? So Chronicles takes these events, idealizes them, and points forward to something in the future. All right? 
So we have Samuel and Kings looking back at Deuteronomy, this cursing, blessing, this covenant promises. We need to go back there. Chronicles is pointing forward to this idealized future of the messianic king and temple. Right? So they, they have different focuses. That's why the way they write about things is different. Is that, is that somewhat clear? You're with me so far? Okay. All right, so what we're going to do now in the next, when does this end, Jeff? 12.15. Okay, we're going to do this really quickly. We're going to compare some text between Chronicles and Kings just to get an idea of what's going on here. So the question is to ask when we're comparing these things. So Chronicles is definitely based on the author who, who wrote Chronicles has Samuel Kings in front of them because there, there's, it's obvious that's happened because there's, there's direct quotations, like huge pieces of direct copying from Samuel and Kings into Chronicles. So the author of, of Chronicles has access to Samuel and Kings. So how, does, how is Solomon presented in Chronicles? Why is some material missing in Chronicles that is in Kings? Why is some material added to Chronicles? And why is some of the shared material presented differently? Those are the questions we've asked. And, and just really important to note here that the chronicler isn't rewriting history. He's not saying this stuff didn't happen. He knows that everybody is aware of the stories in Samuel and Kings. Everyone knows about David and Bathsheba. Okay? But he doesn't include it in his story because his purposes are different. He's not denying it didn't happen. He's not denying that it happened. He is saying he's presenting this idealized version of David, and for his purposes, he, he skips certain stories. He knows it's there. So he's, it's, it's not like a, a cleansing or a sanitation of these stories, because the, the, these stories are there. It's just a different telling of these stories to focus on something a little bit different. Okay. So here we go. Let's start the story of Solomon by looking back at Solomon's mother. Solomon's mother was Bathsheba. Okay. So here we have. Uh, let me do this. Here we have Chronicles and Samuel. Can you see that? And the various stories that are told. These stories are not included in Chronicles. These stories are included in Samuel. Okay. So David and Bathsheba, not included in Chronicles. Totally ignored in Chronicles. Uh, David dealing with his children in not a very positive way for Absalom, for, for some of the stuff that's going on there, the rebellion of Absalom. Whoop, that is all missing from, from Chronicles. Okay? All this stuff is missing from Chronicles. All this negative stuff about, about David. The war with the Philistines. So does anyone have a Bible with you? So, so check out a little difference here. First Chronicles 20. I got, I got two Bibles, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm up on you. First Chronicles 20, verse 4, and 1 Samuel 21. This is talking about the exact same event, okay? Or 2 Samuel, I should say. 2 Samuel 21. Does someone want to read 2 Samuel? Just the first couple of verses of 21, or 21 verse 15. Does anyone want to read that? Once again, there was a battle between the Philistines and Israel. David went down with his men to fight against the Philistines, and he was going to die. And Hishki, the one of the Good. See, I didn't want to read that because there's like hard words there to pronounce. So thanks for that. So now let's read a, uh, the same story in Chronicles. What does it say in Chronicles? Chronicles says, I'll read it for you. In the course of time, war broke out 
in the Phil with the Philistines at Gezer. At that time, oh, I should have got someone else to read this. Some guy, the Hishite killed Sapi, one of the descendants of Raphis, and another battle. To the, so, it, there, so some of the, there's some parallels between these two passages, but what's, what Samuel includes that Chronicles doesn't include is David's weak. David needs to be defended by some other guy, right? That is not included in Chronicles. Because Chronicles, the purpose is he's trying to show that David is the ideal king, right? Then we come to a very problematic passage that people often have a problem with. Uh, David census here. Do you, do you remember this, this story? This story is uh, David makes a census of the military strength of, his, of the nation. And that was against what God wanted. Um, and it doesn't exactly say why. Um, David uh, repents of that. And then God punishes David and Israel by sending a plague to wipe out people. Okay? This, this is the story. So, does someone want to read? Well, hang on. I got it here. So, 2 Samuel 24, verses 1 Chronicles 21. 1 Samuel 24 says this, And the anger of the Lord burned against Israel, and he incited David against them, saying, Go take a census of Israel and Judah. Okay? The Lord incites David to take a census. In Chronicles, it says this, <coughs> Satan rose up against Israel and incited David to take a census of Israel. Right? Um... Any thoughts about that? Is, is, have, have, you, are you aware of this? Has anyone been aware, aware of this before? How do you solve this problem? Or is this a problem at all? It's a problem. Why is it a problem? What's what's? Yeah. So how how do you resolve this problem? What do you think? It's a very translatable as opposed. The opposer, yeah. God can be asking about his plan. Yeah. Or you, or you, or you could think of that, or you could think of this idea that God is ultimately in control, so everything happens by God's command anyway, right? So Satan is also like, like in Job's story, right? The Lord allows Satan to do certain things, so he could do that that differently. But, but remember what we talked about Chronicles. So what, why does Chronicles change the word here, or why is it why is it different here? Right. Although he, he although, uh, or you want to show, you want to show that David, that the Lord is on on David's side somehow, and there's this other thing. So what hap So what happens is David is conscious stricken after he had counted the fighting men, and he said to the Lord, "I have sinned greatly in what I have done. Now, Lord, I beg you, take away this guilt of your servant. I have done a very foolish thing." And Chronicles said, then David said to God, now I have sinned greatly by doing this. Now I beg you, take the guilt away of your servant. I've done a very foolish thing. Okay? So David repents in both cases. And uh, the question is, the chronicler is, has no problems removing stories. Right? There's a story about Bathsheba and David that shows David in a bad light. Just don't, don't, don't include in Chronicles. Why does... Why does a chronicler include this passage? Wouldn't it have been easier for a chronicler just to ignore this totally? Yes, it would have been easier. It would have been easier. Instead, he includes it, but he changes the focus a little bit. But why does he include it? Why does a chronicler include this one when he, when he excludes David and Bathsheba, David's children's stories? Why does he include this one, not the other ones? What's important about the census story? Repentance. Repentance. But later on, so God sent an angel to destroy Jerusalem, right? That's plague. And the angel was doing so. The Lord saw, saw it and relented. Disaster. The angel was, who was destroying people. Enough. Draw your hand. The angel of the Lord was, at the stand, was standing on the threshing floor of Anurad the Jebusite. Right? 
Chronicles, the angel will stretch out his hand to destroy Jerusalem. The Lord relented concerning disaster and said to the angel, enough, withdraw your hand. The angel of the Lord is standing at the threshing floor of that place, same place. Why is that threshing floor important? What's the other, what's the other focus of Chronicles? King, the like King David, an idealized king, what's the second thing? Temple, the temple. The threshing floor becomes the site of the building of the temple. That is where the temple is built. That's why you have to include this story even though you'd rather not. Because it has another theme that the chronicler wants to emphasize is the temple. So this is talking about the history of the temple. Really important. And at the end of this whole thing, David offers a sacrifice in both places. In Chronicles, a fire descends from heaven and consumes the sacrifice. That doesn't happen to kings. So interesting. Okay. How, how are you feeling? Are you okay? So what I'm saying, what I'm what I'm not saying, this is what I'm not saying. What I'm not saying is the Bible contradicts itself. What I'm saying is the the biblical author, inspired by God, is focusing on different themes, so they write the story, they shape the story in different ways. That's what I'm saying. Okay? All right. So here we have in the next section, continuing on. Um, this, none of this is included in Samuel. All this is ignored in Samuel. David is planning for the temple, right? David has all these plans for the temple. In, in, Chronic, in Kings, uh, Solomon does all the planning, all the building of the temple. In Chronicles, David does the majority of the planning of the temple. Again, the reason is David is the ideal king, and it's focusing on temple and David, so giving David... This kind of, this kind of uh, focusing on the temple, connecting those two together is really important to the chronicler. Okay, next section, comparing chronicles with, with, with kings. Uh, so this is a, a, a few other stories here. Um, there's this transition between Solomon, or between David and Solomon, all kinds of things. It takes a while for, for Solomon to establish his temple or his kingdom. So in Chronicles, there's a really nice handoff from David to Solomon, no problem. And in Kings, there's all kinds of this uh, treachery happening. It takes a while for Solomon to establish the kingdom. Yeah. And uh, here's, here's another interesting one. Uh, if you look to uh, 1 Kings 3, this is talking about just before Solomon uh, asked for wisdom in both these places. Solomon, uh, 1 Kings 3 and 2 Chronicles verse 1. So listen to the difference here. Um, I'll read Chronicles first. Chronicles says, uh, verse six. Give you one verse. Right, okay, which Bible is which? Okay. So Solomon and the whole assembly went to the place of Gibeon, for the for God's tent of meeting was there which God, the Lord of servant, had made in the desert. So, so, so the story says that Solomon went to Gibeah because the tent of meeting was set up in Gibeah, and that's what happened there, okay? And in Kings, it says Solomon, the king went to Gibeah and offered had a sacrifice there, for that was the most important of the high places. And Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. And before that, in verse 3, it says, Solomon loved the Lord the God by walking according to the statutes of his father David, except he offered sacrifices and burnt offerings at the high places. So in one, in Kings, it's talking about Gibeah as a high place. In Chronicles, it's saying that the temple of meeting was at the high, was in Gibeah. So it's a very, very interesting kind of connection there. 
And finally, this is probably the most important. Um, this is kind of the, the section of, of Solomon building a temple, very similarities between the two books. And this section here, um, this is also very similar, but there's one thing missing here. Um, Solomon's apostasy and adversaries, it's in Kings, it's mentioned in Kings, but it's not mentioned in Chronicles and the death of Solomon. So, um, how is that? Uh, so my, my point, my, my, my returning to what I'm trying to help you understand is Chronicles has a very specific uh, focus. Samuel Kings has a specific focus and the way that the books are written um, connect with that focus. Um, any questions or thoughts? How are you feeling about this so far? You still, you still with me? Does that make sense? So what you're saying is we can still believe in the Word of God and the inspiration of Scripture, but maybe it just plays out a different way than we often bring to the text. Yeah. Because we're not we're not factoring in the fact that the Spirit inspired the writer to tell the story to address a certain situation. Right. Exactly. Because one, one, the, the one book, Samuel Kings, is written to a certain situation where they're addressing a certain, certain situation, uh, certain problems. Chronicles is written to another situation where it's addressing other problems, right? So the, the people that Chronicles was written to, they needed to know that God was with them, that God had this future of this ideal king, ideal temple. The people in, Psalm, in, the people in, in King Solomon or King uh, Samuel, they need to know that God was still with them, that, that this is part of the cursing and blessing of this covenant, and they can return to this covenant. So it's, they're, they're connected, they're, um, they're inspired. Um, God is speaking through them, but they're speaking to different circumstances and, and using the same stories, shaping them a little differently to speak to these different circumstances. The four gospels. So we also have four gospels. Well, well you have a, you have something in mind? No, well, I, I just want everybody <laughs> to realize that the same thing happens in the gospels. Yeah, there's the a. Writers of each gospel are telling the story of Jesus for a certain purpose to be on the right. Yeah. So when there are things that don't match up, it's not that they're skewing the story; it's that they're emphasizing different things in order to address certain ideas. I right. Think. And Chronicles is telling the story; it's true. Samuel King is telling a story of true. They're just picking different sections to emphasize, right? And when there's this contradiction between Satan and the Lord, there is this idea of, of ultimately the Lord is in, in control. Um, so we can reconcile that way. But it, it becomes problematic. And, and it, I think it helps to reconcile that particular problem by realizing that there's different authors speaking to different contexts, inspired by God to do this. Okay, so next week, um, so I just want to give us an idea of, of how the chronicler talks about Solomon. So Solomon is depicted in this kind of idealistic way and, this, and Temple is depicted in this idealistic way. Next week, I want to talk about how, and I want to go more into depth reading the text of, of Kings. So Solomon in Kings is portrayed fairly negatively. There's a explicit negative stuff about Solomon at the end of the king's section, but he's, implicit, he's implicitly criticized throughout the whole section. So um, your homework is to read 1 Kings 1 to 11 and look for how the narrator of, of this, these, these, this the storyteller is kind of hinting at this negative aspect of Solomon throughout kings. All right.